Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the ALTC conference. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me today to join this meeting. Uh, my name is Sharif Ahmed Khaled. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at Cairo University, and I'm currently the committee, the community development committee officer of the AO Egyptian chapter in Egypt. I'm also a member of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association and Egyptian Pelvis and Hip Society. My presentation will be around, about subtrochanteric fractures, and um, we will start the presentation now. I will be available for your questions during the allocated time. I would like first to acknowledge Dr. Mohammed Tahami from Iran, Dr. Rodrigo Pesantes from Colombia, Dr. Zahar Hassan, and Dr. Mahmoud Abdelkarim from Egypt, uh, whom I had a great help during preparing this lecture. They are my friends, and we meet a lot, and I learned a lot from them as well. I have nothing to disclose. When you have a case like this, an 83 years old Japanese female, she fell while visiting Luxor in Egypt, and she was transferred to Cairo and they needed to be on their plane to Japan in two days. And the flight is about 16 hours. So what would you do for a case like this? First of all, of course, you need to see a lateral view. So this is her fracture, as you can see. What happens here? That's what we will speak about, about the mechanics of the fracture, the loads, the patient characteristics. So my objectives today is to talk to you about the patient aspects the fracture aspects, the mechanical aspects of the fracture, reduction tips, and to compare the treatment options. We have two kinds of patients, either an elderly patient who will sustain usually a low energy trauma, who is usually osteoporotic, has a lot of associated comorbidities and is difficult to anesthetize, and a young patient, on the other hand, who will sustain a very high energy of trauma, who has a good bone quality and usually will have associated injuries. The mechanism in elderly is usually low energy. Usually it's a spiral oblique. And don't forget that subtrochanteric fracture are a common site for metastasis, so don't oversee this. Uh, fracture, the fracture itself has some characteristics as well. Since it's between the lesser trochanter and five centimeters distal to it, usually you have the deforming forces due to the psoas muscle or the iliopsoas, which pulls the proximal fragment in flexion and external rotation, and the gluteal muscles, which pull the fragment in abduction. And hence, in the biomechanics, we have, we, this part of the femur especially experiences very high tensile and compresses forces out of the entire skeleton. You know that the tensile forces are on the outer side and compressive forces are on the inside. So due to the deforming forces causing difficult reduction of the fracture and due to the large forces of tension and compression passing through the implant, add to this the osteoporosis if it's an, in an elderly patient, then we expect non-union or implant failure that you all see. And that's why the subtrochanteric is famous for these two problems. And the famous complication, of course, the painful non-union that we all see is due to these factors. So how do we overcome this? Of course, we need to fix all the subtrochanteric fractures. So a fixation is preferred for all fractures, including the elderly patients. The techniques for fixation include extra medullary plates, like the blade plate, the DCS, and the proximal femoral locked plate, or the cephalomedullary nails, or intramedullary nails, or proximal femoral nails, whatever you call them, or an intramedullary device. What's the difference technically between both? Mechanical advantage. Of course, we know that the surface fixation will have a longer moment arm because the plate will be here, the blade will be there, and the forces of the body are coming down here. So D is definitely longer than D dash. So this is the theoretical advantage of intramedullary devices. They have a shorter moment arm than the extramedullary fixation and hence less bending loads and hence less shaft medialization. So if you have a fracture like this, which implant would you use for it? Probably nowadays we would use all proximal femoral nail because this is a difficult comminuted displaced fracture. 
Here, the surgeon used the proximal femoral lock plate that we are using all the time uh, for the last few years. But unfortunately, since this one has an angle of about less than 90 degrees, so under the forces, it usually fails. So the proximal femoral lock plate was in fashion. However, the last few years, it's be becoming less and less in fashion. Even a paper published in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2016, which was a multi-center study of 111 cases, a retrospective study, compared the proximal femoral lock plate uh, for unstable proximal femoral fractures. And they found that the proximal femoral lock plate is associated with a high complication rate, frequently requires revision or secondary surgeries. And given the high complication rate, they thought, that careful attention to reduction is very important and a consideration should be given to an alternative implant for fixation when you have an unstable fracture. DCS, dynamic condylar screw, we, we all use this for a long time before knowing the cephalomedullary nails, maybe in the 90s, late 90s. It gives you fixation in the proximal fragment. Uh, it's not a dynamic, it's not a weight-bearing device, and it's subjected to plate failure. However, in simple fractures, you may use it. This was published in Injury 2003 by Kulkarni and Moran. They found that 91% uh, union in the young was achieved and 74% union in the old was achieved. However, they found out that 20% uh, sustained plate failure, implant failure, which is not a very good uh, implant then for undisplaced, for displaced and unstable fractures. Uh, looking at the blade plate, it's a rigid fixation. It's a stronger plate than the DCS, but it's a lost art maybe for the newer generations. They don't use it a lot. They don't know the, the, the instruments but maybe they use it more for the subprochanteric valgus osteotomy and failed femoral neck fractures. Then we come to the cephalomedullary nails, which are more in fashion, and they have this mechanical advantage that the nail is a strut preventing or obstructing the sliding of the proximal fragment, and this is an obvious advantage. Also, it has many other theoretical advantages that we all see in our practice, maybe the smaller incisions, less blood loss, less muscle stripping, earlier rehabilitation, weight bearing, shorter hospital stay. But why we call them theoretical advantages? Because we know that sometimes we need to reduce the fracture well. Uh, a paper published in Swiss Surgery in 2001, a randomized control trial comparing blade plate versus gum and nail. Union was 100% in, in gum and nail with early weight bearing. All the complications in the series happened with blade plates and there were only two non-unions with the blade plate. Uh, nail versus fixed angle blade plate, again published in Journal of Orthopedic Surgery 2007. The conclusion was fixed angle blade plate for subtrochanteric fractures has a higher implant failure and revision rates than closed intramedullary nail. So if we are going to choose a nail, then we need to know one very important point. We need an accurate reduction. And the other important point that this accurate reduction should be achieved before guide wire insertion and before reaming. So as we always say, do not ream an unreduced subtrochanteric fracture. Back to our example, the lady, the Japanese lady that I showed you in the beginning. She had this fracture. I put her on the traction table. This is only with traction. I passed the entry point and the guide wire in the proximal fragment. Then I opened an incision and reduced the fracture to pass the guide wire. This is very critical. We have to reduce it before passing the guide wire and before reaming the fracture. So I did the reaming in a reduced position, then passed the biggest nail I can, then locked the nail proximally, then locked the nail distally, and this is the post-operative x-ray. You can see the fracture site. You can see the AP view, and she, was, uh, she left Cairo two days post-operative. Uh, she was weight-bearing. And I received an email from the travel company thanking me that she arrived uh, at, to their home after 17 hours of flight and that they are fine. Another way to reduce is the collinear clamp. It's a fancy um, tool and it's very nice, but it does not exist in my country. Uh, additional reduction tools and simple 
uh, useful reduction tools and tricks were published in 2015 in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma. They included percutaneous joysticks, femoral distractors, finger reduction tool, which is simply putting your finger to reduce the fracture, blocking screws, clamp assisted reduction that I will show you, shans, pins, open reduction, and you know, the pushing clamps and the hooks. This is a picture from Rodrigo Pesantes. He shows you how with the clamp, he pushes the fracture to reduce. This is another way, the hammer uh, pushing on the proximal fragment, which is flexed or even using a clamp or even holding with a bone clamp to reduce. This was published in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 2009. Circlage wires, they may reduce the risk of failure. They, they help with the medial cortical support. They lead to better healing by reducing the lateral fracture opening, and they can be put percutaneously or open. And this was published in several studies, International Orthopedics 2011 by Muller et al., Archives of Orthopedic Trauma Surgery in 2014, and Hoskins et al. in Injury 2015. Uh, this is a picture from my friend Eben Carroll from the USA. You can even use a small provisional anterior plate uh, through an open approach to reduce a subtrochanteric before passing your wire and before reaming. You can use blocking screws or polished screws. They act as a fulcrum for nail trajectory. So while passing the nail, this assists fracture reduction. Then I chose few technical trips from the, from the instructional course lecture by Heidekovich, published in 2009. Technical tip number one, using a trochanteric entry nail. You, you need to start slightly medial to the exact tip of the greater trochanter because the more you go laterally, the more this will lead to a varus reduction of the proximal fragment and this will fail. This was proven again. Most of the papers said avoid varus angulation of the proximal fragment because varus reduction increases the lever arm on the fixation, increases the risk of the vice cut out and this paper by Shukla et al. published in Injury 2007 found that all the complications happened in the varus group. Technical tip three, be cautious about nail insertion trajectory. Beware of the intramedullary femoral bow mismatch because when we use short nails, the short nails are straight. They don't have an anterior bow so they can impinge on the anterior cortex. So make sure that in the lateral view, you will not break the femur distally. That's why sometimes it's better to use longer nails with an anterior bow. Technical tip four, which nail to use? Preferably a third generation, uh, better than uh, the older ones. Longer nails are better than shorter ones to avoid complications like this. And of course, a reed nail. In summary, we spoke about the patient and fracture aspects. And you saw how we have two groups of patients and how this fracture displaces the mechanics of the fracture and you saw how there are tensile and compressive forces on the implants. Several reduction tools were uh, discussed and we stressed this point that we need an accurate reduction, whether done closed, open or mini open before passing our nails. For simple fractures, you can use still both intramedullary nails or plates, they both do well. But complex fractures, they require intramedullary nails. This is the implant of choice nowadays. And very important to choose a correct entry point for the intramedullary nail, avoid varus. And again, I would like to confirm this quality of reduction before reaming is your key to success. Uh, thank you again uh, for your participation. And uh, I would like to uh, thank the organizing committee for inviting me. Thank you all for your participation. And I will be available for questions during the allocated time. Thank you. Bye.